topics today, defining business and IT architecture alignment and transformation, uh, talk about some risks, challenges, and technical debt. Uh, we're going to show you something called the rainbow model for thinking about transformation from a business and an IT perspective. We'll look at a framework for transformation. We'll look at continuous alignment. And then we'll talk about shifting to a uh, business-driven approach. Um, just a quick snapshot uh, recap. There's a new definition of business architecture that was adopted by a uh, broad community, uh, which includes uh, DEMA, the Business Architecture Guild, the IEEE, and COSI, and a number of other uh, uh, enterprise architecture and other professional organizations, which states that uh, it it, it's a multi-dimensional views, business views of capabilities, value delivery, information, organization structure, and alignment to strategy, product, policies, initiatives, and stakeholders. So I just want to recap that quickly. Uh, the IT architecture perspective is essentially blueprints of the automation uh, that enables the business architecture to occur. And um, if you're interested, the uh, Federation of Enterprise Architecture Professional Organizations has these uh, definitions. Uh, the the uh, concept of alignment between business and IT architecture is a state in which automated systems and data architectures fully enable business strategy, business capabilities, and stakeholder value, with value uh, represented as the value streams of business architecture. Uh, we talk about transformation. Transformation is really the means of achieving alignment. How do we get to the point where we're aligned? And we'll look at some examples of um, a good alignment, strong alignment versus misalignment. Uh, before we do that, let's take a quick snapshot of the big picture of enterprise architecture. Uh, enterprise architecture has many components. And when I say enterprise architecture, uh, what I'm essentially talking about is the collective set of disciplines. I'm not talking about business units or how your particular business uh, organizes its architecture teams. Uh, that is really up to your organization to decide. Uh, th so there's no, no, uh, there's no recommendations or judgment calls here in terms of how your teams are set up. Uh, but as a set of disciplines, there has to be a uh, set of relationships established across these disciplines to look at architecture from a biz pic big picture perspective. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, in this perspective, it, it's from an article that was published last year in CIO Review called Business Architecture, Putting Business into Enterprise Architecture. It views the enterprise architecture as a horizontal business architecture perspective uh, that, uh, that aligns to and relates to essentially application architecture, uh, how we organize our, um, our deployable technologies to support the business, uh, data architecture, and then of course the technical architecture, which was what we normally call the plumbing that allows the pieces to fit together. The solution architecture is uh, typically an initiative or horizontal view. I heard a question earlier about solution architects and, and, and business architects. It's a solution architect's job to understand all four of the other architecture perspectives and how they fit together in context of the overall uh, solutions that they're trying to bring to bear on either a portfolio or initiative or other some other span of reference, a specific span of reference there. And they have to know about the technology, the data perspectives, the application deployment services, security, uh, and the business architecture collectively to focus on putting together the big picture. So a good solution architect plays that role. Uh, they are not the business architect, and the business architect is not the solution architect. They're really two different roles. Uh, what I want to do as a lead-in to the transformation conversation is to talk a little bit about technical debt. Now, I'm going to expand the definition and perspective on technical debt beyond what you may historically think of as technical debt. And we're going to give it a different dimension or a second dimension uh, that, that typically is missing from most perspectives on technical debt. So first, look at, let's look at a little bit of historical perspective. Uh, technical debt results from applying IT architecture changes that degrade the data and application architectures over an increasingly elongated time frame, where each set of changes to those architectures increases the time cost of, and cost of applying future changes 
curtailing the business's ability to accommodate strategic objectives and business vision to the point where um, a, a business unit or a group of business uh, executives goes to the board of directors and tells them they can no longer implement or deploy these new types of, of um, investment funds because the systems will not support that. And that is not a matter of fixing one system. That is a matter of having an integrated perspective on your architecture, figuring out what the problem is across many systems and the data architecture and the overall perspectives on architecture and driving solutions around that from a business perspective. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when we hear those types of things, it sounds panic and shivers down the executive spine, but the business executives don't know how to respond to that. Uh, so we have to come up with a, a overall or overarching strategy for dealing with that. How do we get there? Um, IT architectures grow misaligned to the business model on a regular basis as the business model shifts. Uh, continuous pressure from the business up to apply more changes to IT architecture that they were never meant to initially support based on the evolving business model creates more debt. And the lack of executive understanding that technical debt is being incurred and that it presents a significant and growing risk to the business is, is a major issue here and major consideration. So what does it result in? The inability to address customer discontinuity across business units and product lines. I don't know the difference between John Smith here in this that owns these uh, particular investment funds and John Smith here that has these, uh, these checking accounts or loans or insurance funds and so forth. Uh, because I don't know that it's the same John Smith or a different John Smith. And we've seen this in the news most recently, I think, with uh, what's happened with uh, uh, the Wells Fargo situation, which has had numerous headlines uh, published. And um, I, I, I did a talk recently you can reference down here at the bottom on uh, business architecture now or later, a lesson from crisis management. If you're interested, it's a bright talk. Uh, the diminished capacity to manage risk, regu regulatory compliance, and change management. Business costs escalate. Workarounds grow. IT solutions become more disruptive than the problems that they resolve. Essential requirements are applied consistently or missed altogether. And ongoing IT investments appear fully disconnected fully disconnected from priority business challenges. When a, biz, a group of business people say to me, our, biz, our IT people are spending a quarter billion dollars annually on replatforming and reporting our systems, and they're telling us that there's going to be no business uh, impact or, or, I guess, net plus to the business itself out of that. To make those investments and not deliver continuous business value is, is really untenable. So let's take a look at this chart, and we'll look at some metrics on how to plot things on this chart in a few minutes. Uh, evaluating technical debt from two perspectives. Uh, along the bottom axis, we see degradation of data, application, and technical architectures. Uh, that's a traditional view of technical debt. And what it's essentially saying is uh, the underlying architectures from a technology perspective are getting worse. Okay? Now, along the upper left-hand side, we see the level of uh, IT and business architecture misalignment, uh, which represents uh, the, the, uh, how well the IT architectures, uh, the three at the bottom, are enabling the business architecture and business strategy. As that grows, uh, IT, as, a, as the IT solutions we have in place are becoming less and less effective in terms of supporting our mission, uh, our strategic goals, our customer needs and desires, and so forth. Uh, so what we want to look at is really both perspectives. Uh, we want to look at how well the technology uh, is supporting us just from a pure technology perspective and the quality of that but we also want to look at how well it aligns and supports the business architecture, in other words, the business itself and the business strategy and where we're going. If you plot both of those perspectives for any given application or set of applications, 
uh, you're going to fall somewhere along a line where you're either going to be solvent, where you have a situation where you're just undergoing continuous incremental evolution of the business and IT architecture with minimal disruption and minimal capital investment with a high degree of alignment between your systems and the, the business perspectives that they're implementing. However, if you start moving out that, that perspective or out that, that access and you start to see growing debt where you're getting more and more uh, uh, problems with the underlying technical architecture and, and IT architecture, and you're becoming increasingly misaligned with the business architecture, and these tend to go hand in hand. You'll move from growing debt to teetering on the edge to a situation you really don't want to get to, but we have seen, where your systems can no longer support. There's no way to transform your current IT architectures to a point where they can continue to support your business uh, as viewed through the business architecture, your ongoing strategies, and your directions. And that is when you hit a point of bankruptcy. Complete IT architecture replacement major capitalist uh, investment disruptions, uh, and, and also business disruptions. When you get to that point, uh, um, you're in pretty bad shape, and we have to, we've seen where people have had to completely revamp, revamp large chunks of their application data architectures there. Um, I am not talking about the technical architecture largely here, although that comes into play. I am talking about how well your application and data architecture align to support your business. Unfortunately, every time you change a system, many, many businesses are moving up the ladder when they should be moving down the ladder. Each change should reduce technical debt, align you closer to the business, and make the system of higher quality. But unfortunately, many changes we're applying today from an IT architecture perspective are moving us in the opposite direction, towards bankruptcy and towards significant problems. So when we plan a transformation effort, and we're representing that here with our rainbow model, uh, assuming that the left-hand side is your current state and you're going to take many, many transformation journeys to get to some target states over windows of time, uh, we want to look at the full architectural perspective. Uh, as you invest more in your IT architecture transformation efforts, you want to ensure that you're not just moving along the bottom path or the technical architecture, but that you're really transforming them uh, with a full view of the business architecture, which provides the lens into business strategy, the business investments, the program alignment, customer value, and so on, uh, with, with corresponding impacts to your data and application architecture, and then any essential changes to your technical architecture. Uh, as you move up the rainbow and you move through the perspective of the business architecture and back down, the value you deliver on a business perspective side is going to be significantly greater than if you just go straight across the bottom. Unfortunately, many organizations do that. So what we end up seeing, um, so this is the transformation journey uh, that concurrently transforms business data application and technical architectures in sync so everybody's aligned. But unfortunately, what we see are that many organizations are making investments in IT architectures solely based on improving the technical architecture, because that's what we understand, and either ignoring or not understanding the business architecture, and essentially just cobbling workarounds to the data and application architecture. The data and the application architecture is what makes the trains run. It's what keeps the customers happy. It's what keeps the revenue flow moving. It's the technical architecture is the necessary plumbing underneath that. It's the application and data architecture that are essential to delivering business value. And we need to understand the business perspective as part of that. OK, so let's move on to uh, uh, taking a look at the implications of the rainbow model on IT budget allocation and business funding. Okay. Uh, at many organizations, IT will spend on any given year either tens or hundreds of millions of dollars 
annually um, where those investments are not business driven. IT is incumbent upon the business to ensure that these investments are business driven and that the business and deliver business value. So we're in a situation if you're in the IT organization that puts you in a bind. Uh, the business has not provided any degree of articulation of its business architecture in some organizations. In many they have, in, some, in many they haven't. So you really have nothing upon which to base your business perspective on other than a uh, bottom-up, highly siloed set of typically non-rigorous uh, uh, But there is no business perspective or business architecture perspective to really understand your business in clear, concise, non-redundant terminology. So it's incumbent upon the business to help frame the investments in business terms that clearly articulate and reconcile business objectives and investment focal points within the business before the discussion shifts to how, I'm, how much I'm going to spend on that system or what I'm going to do to that database. When the business people come in the door and tell IT that you need to fix or change this system or change that database or do these things with technologies, they are, that is like walking into a doctor's office and demanding that the doctor go in and repair a part of your body without telling you what the symptoms are and without letting IT have a basic understanding of the anatomy, uh, which essentially is the business architecture of a person, uh, and, and, and what exactly is wrong. In other words, it's the, it's the patient telling the doctor what they're going to do versus the other way around. Uh, they also need to ensure that all IT investments have traceability back to business objectives and impact the business focal points and questioning and challenging major investments that only impact IT architecture. Don't spend the money if there's no business value. Now, the budgets are there, the money's being spent, the projects are in flight, and it's going to get spent one way or another, whether the business engages in, in this conversation or not. So IT is going to go ahead and take its quarter billion next year and replatform uh, X amount of applications and do many, many other things, right? Um, it's up to the business to say, hold it, we need to rethink that. So there's a lot of ways to think about that. Um, the business architecture provides that framework. This is not a uh, discussion on the details of business architecture today. Um, I will just repeat what Shailen said in the last session. Uh, if you want to get a clear and concise understanding of business architecture, you can go to the Business Architecture Guild and um, you can, you can um, get the information on capability mapping and value stream mapping and so forth to get a good understanding. We will use those terms in this conversation. Okay? So what we're talking about here when we're looking at transformation planning is moving back to our matrix, understanding our level of technical debt. And we can do that through sets of metrics. Now, to the, back to the things which are uh, relatively well-defined in terms of metrics and relatively well understood from an IT perspective. We have a set of IT architecture metrics uh, that are out there and uh, they're reasonably well defined and if you're interested you can go to the Consortium for IT Software Quality or CISC and you will see that they have defined uh, detailed metrics for things like reliability, security, maintainability and performance efficiency. Those metrics, in fact, have been driven through uh, the standards organization, the object management group, or OMG standards organization, into formal standards, and in some cases have already been standardized, and in other cases are still going through the cycle. And they are now going through and uh, being moved into uh, fast track through ISO standards. So on the left-hand side, understanding the degradation of data application technical architectures, we have known metrics known measures, uh, there is tooling out there to measure those things, and they, they are standardized metrics, and they are being globally adopted on a wide scale. Okay. That is the left-hand side. That's the part, as IT people, we understand. 
let's talk about the part that's harder to understand, harder to delineate, and typically not really looked at when you're looking at technical debt. The left-hand side, the level of IT and business architecture misalignment. What do business IT architecture alignment metrics look like? We'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we need to understand how well our IT architecture deploys our business architecture, our business perspectives. So one example is capability instances across IT assets. Now those can be those metrics need to be balanced with other numbers, but in that example, I would have let's say a capability called contract management or agreement management. That particular capability is going to have many, many instances, particularly if you've used uh, fragmented reference models that are in the market that you see out there quite frequently, where uh, a contract, the concept of a contract uh, as a business object might show up in dozens and dozens of systems, where one system does part of the work, passes it to another system, and so on. So in that case, you'd have dozens and dozens of instances of either contract management or some of the child capabilities underneath there. And you can represent those instances through relationships between the business architecture and the IT architecture, and then you can roll those numbers back into metrics. You can also look at other kinds of metrics, and there are many, of course, here, but capability automation percentages. In a given capability map, when you go down to the details and you look at, um, it depends on the complexity of your business model, anywhere from uh, uh, 500 to 750 to maybe well over 1,000 uh, capabilities in a capability map that might be decomposed down to, say, level 4 and 5, uh, what you'll see is that uh, roughly 50% of those are either implemented manually um, or through desktop solutions and are not actually in the IT architecture. They've never been automated. The other 50% have been automated over and over and over again across many systems in many places in many ways. So you have a um, high degree of redundancy in terms of the implementation. You do not have a services-based perspective, a reusable services-based perspective. You've got fragmentation because the work is scattered. And then you've got a high degree of non-automation uh, for things that you should be automating or might want to automate based on business strategy. And the case, those two metrics will tell you a lot. No, those are not the only metrics. And these metrics on the left-hand side are still, still evolving. But it does allow you to plot perspectives, OK? And um, if you start looking at the plotting that goes on here across these four quadrants, uh, we would see that um, up in quadrant one, uh, we have some applications up there that are um, highly misaligned. Uh, the IT foundation requires major architectural investment, um, almost a complete redo. Uh, where in quadrant two, over to the left-hand side, we'd see that uh, the technology is better, but the business is still misaligned. Business and IT architectures are still highly misaligned. Uh, we probably need to do some improvements uh, to how well it's aligned, to how well the IT architecture aligns to the business. That could probably be functional investments. Uh, if you're over to the bottom right, you're well aligned to the business, but it's the platform that's a problem. That's where platform migrations occur. If you're doing platform migrations in this portfolio, and you're doing any platform migrations uh, as a sole standalone outside of quadrant uh, uh, four, down in the bottom right-hand side, uh, you probably have your investments misplaced. If you're up in quadrant two and you're doing a platform migration, you really are spending your money in the absolute wrong spot. Now, where you want to be is to move everything back down to quadrant three, where you've got good alignment and incremental improvements occurring over periods of time. Uh, that, that's what you're trying to, to, to achieve here, right? So if you can plot the metrics on the prior slide, uh, you can get to the point where you can start to plot your, your applications and start to figure out how you're going to make your investments. Now, it is important to recognize that, that a lot of applications are inter interrelated in your application architecture and your, your, um, your alignment to the, your business architecture will tell you that. But at least this gives you a, a baseline point to start making some of those decisions. All right. So having that in hand, uh, what we'd like to do 
is to understand uh, how we want to go about this uh, to maximize my value, I should take a look and make sure my IT investments are directly traceable to clearly defined business objectives. How do I do that? Well, one is to set measurable, attainable business objectives. And um, it's unfortunate and shocking, but common, that businesses don't actually have clearly defined measurable, attainable business objectives laid out in actionable ways. Uh, in other words, something that actually could be attained. Not a general mission statement like make my customers happy, but clear, concise objectives on things you're trying to achieve. So that's the first step. Um, and, and obviously you can do all this in parallel, but it is important to have those. Now you want to frame those objectives through the, through the business architecture perspective. And we're going to take three of the four baseline perspective on our business architecture, which we showed you a few slides ago in that small circle. And we're going to say we want to view them through uh, stakeholder value delivery using our value stream, the enabling capabilities that connect to the value stream and provide the rigor and discipline to allow you to navigate a value stream to achieve stakeholder value, and the business information which aligns to the capability objects and definitions as defined on the left-hand side. If I can understand the impact of my business objectives through that lens, my world just got a lot easier because now as I bring up, and I'm using a services-oriented architecture here, but if you don't have one, that's okay too. You can use anything on the left hand, right-hand side. Uh, your IT architecture view um, can, can, you can have a clear relationship established between these two. As you establish that relationship, you can say that the value streams frame service orchestration. The capabilities provide the framework for your services your, uh, that you want to deploy in your services-oriented architecture. And the information views provide the business information perspective necessary to ensure that your data aligns to the capability-driven services that are coming over from the business side. So because the capabilities and the information perspectives are aligned, and you use those to drive your services-oriented architecture and your reusable services perspective, and your data architecture perspective, those two will align on the right-hand side. And if you use the value-driven, stakeholder value-driven perspective, along the top, the value stream perspective, that means that the orchestration of your services will align to the enabling capabilities that sync to the value streams. If you understand the left-hand side of this picture and how it aligns to the right-hand side, and again, you can replace these services with legacy architectures, the, the cross-mapping fits, and we'll show you an example of that in a couple minutes. Um, you will understand how to drive IT architecture investments from a business strategy down perspective using IT architect or using business architecture. This is a critical understanding and a critical baseline for where you want to go. Now let's take a look at a framework that makes this actionable. Uh, we have our current business architecture and we want to view that through the lens of uh, my stakeholders on the right hand side here. Uh, my policies and procedures, my business uh, strategies and objectives, uh, my uh, products and services and those related plans, framed initiatives, okay, uh, which will tell you the investments that you want to make to implement the objectives that, that, and, and the policies upon the products aligned to the capabilities, value streams, and information. And we have metrics, of course, there. So we want to understand that transformation view. We also want to understand our current IT architecture as well as what the target state looks like. The old as is on the bottom left and the new future state on the bottom right. And we want to understand that there is some desire because of the momentum to move from a business transformation perspective along the top to move from an IT transformation perspective along the bottom. In order to figure out how we want to accomplish that, we have to do two things. One is we have to understand how the current systems implement the business architecture in its current state today. If we don't understand that, 
we don't know where we are and we're going to be lost in the woods and, and not be able to find our way out. We need to understand that. Uh, I've heard people say, we don't need to understand that. That is a myth. You need to have a baseline understanding of where your capabilities are implemented today or you will drive up technical debt instead of driving it down. You will create more redundancy, more fragmentation, and not make any impacts on capability automation. Now, here's the hard part. None of cr the creation of these four uh, different uh, corners here, the current state business architecture, establishing a lens into the business uh, tr strategy and transformation through the business architecture on the upper right, understanding my current state IT architecture, and crafting a new IT architecture going forward, a target state, the ideal state that I want to get to, none of those particular individual pieces, including building the relationships among them, are, are, are rocket science, okay? They are doable. They take some work. You need to follow some principles and some approaches. I'll tell you the hard part. The hard part is concurrent business transformation and IT transformation from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, particularly if your IT architectures are reaching the point, the tipping point of bankruptcy. That's the hard part. But if you do not understand the four corners of this framework, if you do not understand their relationships, current state and target state, you cannot even get to the starting line of doing the hard work and you're going to fall back into the pattern of spending 200 or 300 million dollars next year on platform transformation transformations along the rainbow model example without understanding that you you're not touching the business or transforming the business in a way that will drive up customer value implement business objectives and reduce technical concurrently reduce technical debt so let's take a look at uh, some of the baseline relationships behind the scenes here. Uh, this is for the uh, architects out there who like to understand how things connect. This is a very, very simple set of connections here, but we'll show them and, and sort of run through uh, a summary. Um, we're showing here the four aspects of, uh, well, actually, we have uh, one additional one. But the four main central aspects of business architecture, what we call the, the core domains the value stream and, and related value stream stages, capability, which uh, enable value streams, and you can see that uh, enables value stream stages. You can see that relationship here. Uh, the business units and the relationship that business units have to the capabilities that they have, okay? as well as the information and how that relates, ties back to the capability here. Information, business unit, capability, value stream. If you understand those four domains, you've got your baseline business architecture. We're also looking at initiative investments and the impacts on capability and impacts on value stream. Having that in hand, and we're not showing objectives and other things here, but the, this actual meta model, and uh, if you're listening to Jeff Walk's session later today, you'll hear a lot more about the underlying meta model behind all this. This actual meta model is, is, is larger than what we're showing. We're just kind of giving you a snapshot. Uh, so you would then see that um, uh, the objectives can be driven through value streams and capability and so forth. Now, we're also connecting it to the application architecture up here, uh, where, which capabilities are implemented across which application systems, subsystems, also within which services are they implemented, uh, and how do those relate to your application architecture, and what's your data architecture look like, and what is your relationship between your information mappings and your data architecture? If you have this understanding and you can, re and you can reflect this information, uh, you have the baseline to move forward with being able to do the things like we're going to talk about here. And what we're talking about here uh, is understanding how we drive stakeholder value through a value stream with enabling capabilities that are automated through a series of existing software systems, maybe future state, but existing software systems uh, that are tied to various business units. And uh, what we can establish through this uh, and using the prior view is understanding um, through the lens of the capability how we deliver stakeholder value and using the capability lens as the lens into the IT architecture. And so instead of trying to connect 
uh, people or processes to the systems, which is an endless spiral of, of spaghetti complexity. You're using the core, non-redundant, well-defined, highly rigorous set of capabilities uh, to link to the value delivery perspective on the top, uh, back down to the system perspective and the business unit perspective at the bottom. Okay, there's, there's a lot more to this. I'm just showing you a snapshot, but it is an example. And in this example, we have how somebody would acquire a loan, the capabilities necessary to enable that. Now, this is a small subset. Typically, you'd have a lot more capabilities underneath there. The systems that implement those uh, in a current legacy state, because you see a lot of redundancy and the business units involved. This is your baseline understanding. Now, if we talk about where we want to go, Strategically, in terms of moving forward, uh, we have a current state um, and we want to see what the future state looks like. Notice here that our capability map essentially along the top looks the same. Why is that? Well, let's dispel some quick myths here. Capability map maps are not built for a given project, a given business unit, a given investment, or a given program. They are long-standing, rigorous uh, baseline frameworks that represent the business uh, across the ecosystem, which means across business units, across programs, across projects, and across time. They are a baseline. The capability map will have capabilities that are reflected as being automated and not automated. Uh, you can do that through these cross mappings, which are showing you right here. Uh, and on the prior slide, uh, they will also have capabilities that are in very good shape and some that aren't in such good shape. And we use heat mapping to show that. And in some cases, you may want to add some new capabilities. That means that it is something that has nothing to do with automation. It is something the business does not do today but desires to do it because of a shift or change in their business model or some other evolution that occurred. Those also can show up in your capability map as future states, and we can, we can heat map those as well. But you have a single capability map, and you want to reflect on the left-hand side, how is it implemented today? You can see a lot of redundancy versus a services-oriented architecture to the right where we've got re reusable services uh, that, are, that are linked directly to the capabilities, which are then redeployed through an application architecture environment. A couple of quick points. Services, uh, IT services, and capabilities share a lot of the same uh, attributes. They are object-based, they are self-contained, they are non-redundant, uh, they are non-fragmented, and so forth. So there's a lot of relationships there that we have uh, that we establish. And that, that's important to recognize as you go through these, uh, these transformation discussions. So let's take a look at where you want to be on the perfect scale of that uh, matrix we showed previously in a uh, incremental, ongoing, non-disruptive, uh, from, from an investment, from a business perspective, uh, continuous change perspective. So you want to be able to uh, avoid the major disruptive investments that you see today, very expensive, very high risk, uh, and, and, and typically very disruptive to the business and shift that over uh, from, from these many, many siloed investments you're making today across the many dozens or hundreds of projects you have running, which are in many cases might be at odds with each other uh, and cause a tremendous pattern of disruption over to something that should be uh, seeking continuous, non-disruptive, transformative alignment between the business and IT architectures driven by business objectives, top-down from a holistic perspective across business units without regard to this. Uh, of course, silos become and come into play for funding and planning and those types of things. But without the, um, uh, the redundancy and fragmentation that's driven out of our silo-based planning approaches that we have today. This is where you want to get to. This is what you want to achieve. So how do we shift to this new perspective? You want to frame every IT investment from a business objective standpoint. If you do not have direct traceability of an IT investment back to a measurable, well-defined business objective, 
Ideally, that's delineated, uh, that's represented through capabilities and value streams and information views in the business architecture. Uh, you shouldn't make the investment. Uh, so where they're not traceable, stop the investment. Highlight the overlap of initiatives based on capability and related value impacts. That gets into your whole program management and initiative mapping perspective. Take stock of failed IT investments and figure out why, and then find out what the business really thinks of IT spending $1 billion on a platform migration over the next five years with no discernible business value. Get their opinion and find out what they really want to accomplish and shift your investment perspectives to that. Um, and unfortunately, we see that some organizations have to reach a low point before they realize that they need to make a change. We had uh, VPs uh, from a, a series of business units just telling us nightmare stories about how they felt that the business was just on a downward spiral. Uh, when the, when the C, CIO got a hold of the report that was written explaining all this and, and what needed to be done about it, uh, what essentially she did was to take that report and bury it and pretend it was never written because uh, she believed that it introduced risk to her job uh, even though ignoring that report and ignoring the IT uh, or the business issues that were uh, at the core of it uh, created risk for the company. 